back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett at CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. All the cool kids want drugs in the water. We've got that story, plus some good news about illicit trails. But first, the swamp thing strikes back. Trump taps ex-Monsanto executive to lead wildlife agency. America's Next Top president says he is nominating a former executive at agribusiness giant Monsanto, which, of course, we know doesn't exactly exist anymore. They're retiring the name of they've been absorbed into the bear monstrosity, but still in the public, still referred to as Monsanto, nominating a former exec at Monsanto to head the Fish and Wildlife Service. Aurelia Skipwith of Indiana, currently Deputy Assistant Interior Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, a biologist and lawyer, a deadly combination. Skipwith spent more than six years at Monsanto and has worked at the USDA and at the USAID, which I think we generally know is a pretty close conduit to the CIA. If confirmed by the Senate, Aurelia Skipwith would be the first African-American to head the Wildlife Agency which has 9,000 employees and a $2.8 billion annual budget. Fish and Wildlife Service has been without a Senate-confirmed director since Trump took office in January 2017, which is a whole other set of hilarious shenanigans involving people who don't even have college degrees in the area that they want to run. Not that I'm saying that's the end-all, be-all, but just in their world, you'd, you'd think they'd have a piece of paper that says they know how to do the thing. Chris Sager, executive director of the liberal Montana-based Western Values Project, called Aurelia Skip with, quote, a darling of corporate special interests and said her nomination was business as usual for an administration that has sought to reward its allies at the expense of public lands and wildlife. As we know, both phony sides do that, James. Another, I think, fine tradition, fake left and the phony right – just like Obama brought in, remember, Michael Taylor from Monsanto. And then even going several more years back, Poppy Bush got Clarence Thomas into SCOTUS. So both fake sides love the eugenics-obsessed multi-generational serial killers at Bayer Santo. James? Indeed they do. Uh, that's a good point. And yes, to pretend like this is some new phenomenon with the Trump administration is just more of the phony, stupid, left-right, garbage pol political game. For people who don't know about the Bayer Santo revolving door and why it is a problem, I would humbly suggest that they go back to episode 340 of my podcast, Bayer plus Monsanto equals a match made in hell, which I think puts the case strongly enough. Um, but perhaps more to the point... People might remember one of the latest stories to come out was from that uh, case in California with the 46-year-old former groundskeeper who sued Monsanto for uh, the fact that the Roundup, the glyphosate in the Roundup uh, weed killer that he was applying, uh, was responsible for his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and he was awarded $289 million in punitive and compensatory damages as a result of winning that case, i.e. the jury upheld, yes, your cancer was the result of your uh, handling of this glyphosate. And the judge upheld that verdict. That is the latest. The judge upholds Monsanto verdict, but cuts the reward to $78 million, $39 million punitive, $39 million compensatory, which, uh, I mean, is still a victory and is still a court case which upholds, yes, your cancer was the result of glyphosate, a pretty important verdict. Um, but the latest, latest, literally just in the past day from farmfutures.com, Monsanto may get new trial on punitive damages, which basically says that if the plaintiff does not accept the reduced damages awarded by this California jury, then Monsanto will get a new trial. So who knows? The story is not necessarily over yet. And because of the Bear Santo revolving door in government and, and the courts and everywhere else, it does sort of make this, uh, to put a question mark over the legal wrangling around issues like this. One can hope that ultimately this continues to uh, to be upheld, um, but you never know what tricks the Monsanto lawyer slash whatever's <laughs> have up their sleeves. That's, that's exactly right, yeah. If they're, the two things they're really good at is creating chimeric genomic monstrosities and also litigating the hell out of you in case you have some sort of problem against that. I mean, that's what Clarence Thomas was a Monsanto lawyer. Michael Taylor was a Monsanto lawyer. And now this uh, Aurelia is, is another Monsanto lawyer, James. I had heard and covered a little bit about the lowered and lowered damages number. And that, I mean... 
to put it into perspective for folks here in the States, far, far, far below what the big lotto fever is right now. Of course, we reach the big lottery fever pitch every every year or so, and it reaches these astronomical levels far lower than anybody winning the big lotto even gets now, just for a little bit of perspective. That's a great welcome back here at the kickoff of Neural Next Week, episode 354 for November 1st, 2018. It is fantastic to be back, James. A really disturbing story for our second one. And it's just another kind of oldie making the rounds again. Researchers still want to put lithium in the water supply to prevent suicide. We take this from Vox. A little more information about that on the far side of this info. Lithium is a potent psychiatric drug, one of the primary prescribed medications for bipolar disorder. But it's also an element that occurs naturally all over the Earth's crust, including in bodies of water. That means that small quantities of lithium wind up in the tap water you consume every day. Just how much is in the water varies quite a bit from place to place. Naturally, that made eugenics-obsessed crazy researchers curious. Are places with more lithium in the water healthier mentally? Do places with more lithium have less depression or bipolar or, most importantly of all, fewer suicides? A 2014 review of studies concluded that the answer was yes. Four or five studies reviewed found that places with higher levels of trace lithium had lower suicide rates. And Nasir Gahemi, a Tufts psychology professor who co-authored that review, argues that the effects are large. High lithium areas, he says, have suicide rates 50 to 60 percent lower than those of low lithium areas. They think we could save tens of thousands of lives a year with a very simple, low-cost intervention, putting small amounts of lithium, amounts likely too small to have significant side effects into our drinking water the same way we put fluoride in to protect our teeth. This article goes on and on from Vox, and it even includes, of course, a podcast that they made, too, about it. This newsflash is indeed from, I'm not just saying this to be mean, an autistic millennial named Dylan Matthews, senior correspondent at Vox. He got his start at the CIA's favorite newspaper and is known for using lots of pictures in his articles. You can learn more about that bit of truthiness from his Wikipedia entry, which we will include in the show notes, James. I mentioned even on my morning show this morning, in addition to, of course, all the things we know that's in our water, there's also traces of hallucinogens and other banned drugs found in meats. So that's ketamine, horse tranquilizer, and of course, antidepressants found in all kinds of meats. And then, of course, that's the gnarly factory farmed kind of meats, not the more organically raised. So, James, this idea keeps coming around again. And I believe we've heard this from from some cats before, right? We absolutely have. And I know you've been around long enough to have seen this. I've seen it. I've put it in some of my uh, videos. Um, Speaking about the fluoride issue in particular, because of course this is a related issue, and of course it's brought up in this rich-inducing article from Vox, which I can't really recommend people read, but I guess if you must see the propaganda, go and stomach it and read through it and see the smarm dripping from every paragraph of this. I could barely make it through without literally retching. Um, where they start talking about, oh, as soon as you start talking about putting something in the water supply, you have small or anti-government people responding very vigorously against that, as if this is some sort of, why on earth would they be against this? This is all for your good. And then they go on to say, oh, the absurd controversy continues to this day. Uh, Dr. Mehmet Oz, the wildly popular, wildly irresponsible TV doctor, has brought on a fluoride conspiracist... Aaron Brockovich of Julia Roberts movie fame to sow fear and disinformation. (laughs) If that's the reaction to an effort to improve dental health, just imagine the public outcry against a major push for adding lithium to the water. All right, so many things to break down in this article, and uh, perhaps I will devote an entire propaganda watch to this article, but long story short, for people who don't know, and I'd like to think there is no one in our audience who doesn't know, uh, this crosses all sorts of lines. I mean, The issue of fluoride and whether drinking fluoride in the water is actually helping your teeth is a whole other scientific issue. But beyond that, it is the forced drugging of society. Forced medication. This is a very important topic, and it's not just small or anti-government conspiracy theorists who care about it. It is humanity that should care about this. It is a crime against humanity to force to drug the population. You live in our geographical distinction, so we, uh, area, so we could do whatever we want to you and your body. 
absolute nonsense. For people who want the argument against that, I did talk about this quite specifically five years ago in a GRTV report called Fluoride Fight, the Forced Drugging of Society, which brings up that issue specifically. And that's the key issue here. If they can do it with fluoride, they can do it with lithium. And if they can do it with lithium, who knows what else they'll decide is good for you and put in your water in this gigantic, uncontrolled experiment in which there's no way to really know how it's really affecting the population as a whole, because, of course, no doctor would give the same prescription and the same dosage to every single patient that walks in the door, uh, regardless of whether they exhibit any symptoms or not or anything like that. That's insanity. We would never allow that in a doctor's office, but for some reason put in the water supply, sure. You know, what could go wrong? Oh boy, do I have a Batman movie you guys should watch. Um, anyway, this is an incredibly important issue. It goes to the fundamental point about who owns your body, which is one of the fundamental issues about governance in general, and they want to just drip it in all this smear and smarm and, oh, smugness. The only good thing to come out of this, I think, is, I don't know about your experience, James, but my experience seeing this online, whenever there's a comment section or ability for people to talk back to this, no one's buying this. No one these days, no one under 40 who has uh, grown up in the internet age is going to just l absorb this and go, oh, okay, this is the new thing that we must all believe. Okay, lithium is good. Um, people fight back against this, and uh, deservedly so. It is just nonsense. Well, that's that's the interesting thing to say with, that we've seen this make the rounds before. I mean, it was the, the Paul Ehrlich and the eco-science guys who pushed this 40 years ago with, again, the hip intelligentsia kind of college set. And it kind of had an effect then, and James is oh, now we see it basically with the kind of the young, hip, Vox, you know, podcast making set. Even sidebar, I started reading a new horror comic the other day called Man Eaters that features putting drugs in the water as part of just like the main plot point. So it is this not new idea kind of currying favor with the hip, young comics and podcast set. I guess that makes us look kind of old now, James. <laughs> Our third and final story on this New World Next Week is a good news story and also one fairly philosophical. We often kind of talk about, and the, there's the old adage, the, you know, small minds talk about people and events. We want to be of a larger mind and talk about ideas. An interesting one from The Guardian, believe it or not, Desire Paths, the illicit trails that defy the urban planners. We've all been there. You want a shortcut to the bus stop, office, or corner shop, but there's no designated path. Others before you have already flattened the grass or cut a line through the hedge. Why not, you think? So goes the logic of desire paths, described, I think, and named by Robert McFarlane as paths and tracks made over time by the wishes and feet of walkers, especially those paths that run contrary to design or planning. He calls them free, free will ways. The New Yorker has other names like cow paths, pirate paths, which I like, social trails. Jay and Barry describe them as paths that have made themselves. Reddit apparently has desire path threads. Tens of thousands of people following them, delighting in the more mysterious and illogical seeming of them. They can form anywhere from apparently forgotten corners of cities to the grounds of national governments. Some are so well established that you can essentially see them from satellite imagery. Desire paths have been described as illustrating the tensions between the native and the built environment and our relationship to them. Because they often form in areas where there are no pavements, they can be seen to indicate the yearning of those wishing to walk a way for city dwellers to write back to city planners giving feedback with their feet. But as well as revealing the path of least resistance, they can also reveal where people refuse to tread. If you've been walking the same route for years and you got an itchy-footed urge to go off the path even by just a few feet or meters, it's probably something you can identify with. It's this idea that led another academic journal to describe these desire paths as a record of civil disobedience. James, I know this is something you have precisely talked about before, and we've, of course, all seen that meme of the fence put over the sidewalk that everyone can just go around, and that's, in essence, government planning versus free will ways. James? Exactly right, and thank you for bringing a bit of philosophical reflection to our uh, to our podcast here. I, I do appreciate it, because it is it is profoundly important. It seems so simple, but it says something really important about the nature of humanity and the nature of 
economics and many other things. So let me take this opportunity to <laughs> plug something that I've done. <laughs> this is getting very self-pluggy, but hey, why not? Uh, I did talk about this quite specifically in a video that I did uh, a year ago called Economics in One Image, which I am... Tickled pink to note that there were some people who truly didn't understand that video <laughs> because I didn't I didn't elaborate and I didn't really talk about it. But it is exactly this point: desire paths showing that you can plan all you want. You can have central planners who decide in a committee this is the best way for people to go from point A to point B. But people will decide otherwise if they see a better a better route and uh, they will enact that and that has again this is not just about the way people walk although it is about that but it's also about the way people interact in all sorts of different ways you must go along this path you must do this no no i want to do that and everyone does that and suddenly you have a new path and that that's an extremely important point and it says a lot of things so i'll just Leave it there. I'll leave it to uh, people to look at my economics in one image video for the articulation of, of why that's important in an e economic context. I think I first really consciously thought about this when I saw it with my own eyes back at, when I was still in college. Towards the end of the college years, of course, you're able to make it to the cooler upperclassmen part of campus. These new sort of quads that were that were relatively new. They probably only had been built in, the, I think, the late 70s, probably at the at the earliest and very instantly, you could see all these dirt paths in different ways deviating from the obviously dumb ways they had built the sidewalks. And that was the, one of the earliest parts I kind of started to think about this, how people vote with their feet. And I've been thinking about it even more recently, James, moving down here to the American Southwest. It's not super walkable friendly, especially coming from a place like Oregon, moving down to New Mexico. It's kind of lack of sidewalk. So again, I've been kind of thinking about this idea. So not only physically, but also just a little more philosophically. And that's how we close episode 354 of New World Next Week. Hey, I can do it too, Mr. Pluggy. I am back on the air Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. As I like to say, I stream news, music, memes, and more. And I hope people come check it out. And on a deprogramming note, again, let me stress, uh, as you will have noted, I'm sure, I am not putting out very much right now. I'm not publishing much to CorbettReport.com in the last couple of weeks and probably won't be for the next week or so. As once again, let me remind people, I am working on something behind the scenes that you will see very quick, uh, very soon, and uh, you will know it when you see it. Um, but it is taking up all of my time and attention at the moment, so I don't have a lot of time to be doing Propaganda Watch or whatever else um, at this point. So in the next few days, hey, maybe I'll put up some of the videos that I mentioned uh, here. I'll put them up on the front page of CorbettReport.com, and, uh, and if anyone has any suggestions for anything that they want to see on the front page during this absence, leave them in the comments, and I'll uh, do my best to accommodate. Uh, but as I say, it'll be a little bit slower here at CorbettReport.com for the next 10 days or so. All right. Maybe, of course, there's probably no shortage of things to maybe have an open thread about there on the old Corbett Report, as we have pretty much shut down, of course, the Halloween and, of course, the real fears of the big selections coming up here in the States. James, we'll continue to watch all that stuff. And it's good to be back with you, buddy, after a little bit of a break. Absolutely. Let's do it again next week. Talk to you later. All right. Take care.